I am very, very pleased to welcome you to this uh, session. The COVID-19 emergency with its catastrophic impact on the health of populations and economy has required commitment, cooperation, collaboration from all. Six months after all this began, we know for sure that any scenario that includes a promising outcome after the emergency requires transparency in the use of public resources and informed participation. In an effort to help responding to the urgent need for transparency and accountability in COVID-19, extraordinary fiscal packages, gift stewards and partners work collectively in the development of the guide that we will be talking about today. Gift seeks to help governments to clearly identify the data sets and data fields that should be integrated and disclosed to ensure that transparency is embedded in their policy responses. For civil society and advocacy groups, the objective is to simplify the process of prioritizing the data required to enable tracking, analysis, and informed participation. Lorena Rivero from the gift coordination team has led and worked very hard on the guide the version for public consultation, which we put together in March, and today's version, which includes your comments and suggestions. This is a gift network outcome. It is very important for us to present this version of the gen in the general uh, stewards meeting of gift, as um, this assembly, what we call the general stewards meeting, is also the advisory body of GIFT responsible for defining its guiding principles and norms, thereby ensuring that it continues to evolve to meet the value proposition of the network. An important pertinent item of this year agenda is for that reason, this guide. We are very pleased to have in the uh, presentation of the formal version of the guide, my good friend Richard Allen from the International Monetary Fund, uh, Catherine Frauser and Lindy Marcheseau from the Open Contracting Partnership, and from the Ministry of Finance of Croatia, Hanna Sordovic. Thank you all for your presence I and know. let me pass it to Lorena uh, that will guide us not only on discussing the guide but also on the structure of our session. And Mikhail uh, Branich as well, who's also going to be presenting. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Mikhail. I said hello <laughs> to you. I just saw. <laughs> Mikhail Abronik, our dear friend from the Institute of Public Finance, a very important ally of GIFT in the work we do uh, in uh, that beautiful part of the world. Thank you. So. Hi everyone, um, we already know each other, so I am Lorena and I will be introducing the COVID guide for, emer well, the fiscal data guide for emergency responses. So first of all, I would ju just like to take a second to remind us, sorry, of why we need fiscal openness in times of emergency because we have in mind that it's to combat corruption but while developing and speaking about these topics when we started talking about the emergency first we thought about the part of uh, health but then you start seeing that it's not just about health it's going to online education then and it's um, the complications for the economy for the lockdowns and then less tourism. So you start seeing all the, the um, changes that start happening in the economy because of COVID-19. So um, we need a fiscal openness, not just a, because of this, but for the whole financial management a, of a country. So we want to trace and design the implementation of the measures. We want to identify sustainability and flag any potential risks. 
we want to improve efficiency and effectiveness when we are doing fast decision making. I know this is ambitious, but this is about uh, also being prepared for the future. Um, we want, of course, to prevent or detect corruption. Uh, make sure that measures that are meant to be temporary actually are thinking about uh, tax benefits, for example. And finally, to enable public participation in the fiscal process is uh, still in context of emergency and with a, an informed participation. So in this context is that we have uh, worked in getting together what we're presenting today that is uh, the fiscal data for emergency response, the guide for COVID-19 and it's at the version 1.1. I will discuss why this is version 1.1 and we are very happy uh, to be presenting this. Uh, so what is this guide? First of all, it's a practical tool. This is a very, very practical tool, not discussing the, the policy subject. It's a tool for practitioners, whether they are from civil society, government or oversight institutions. And it's to help identify the data sets and data fields that are required, not just for transparency, but also for internal decision-making processes. So this guide, and we have seen it uh, in, in the consultations that is, uh, first it was this concept of the guide for open data. Well, this is a guide for internal data that you would like to have inside of a Ministry of Finance for decision-making, but also to have meaningful fiscal transparency. And with this, uh, as I am talking about also internal data, it's for better financial management data architecture. So we're going to the data architecture that governments have. Um, because one of the things that we've seen is uh, from this emergency is that the data architecture is often not there. Um, the methodology for development has been a whole process of co-creation. So this started with some uh, blog posts and webinars uh, where uh, we, we've had you already here participating, the IMF, Open Contracting, we had the Accountability Lab in this uh, first webinars. We then had uh, some sessions of co-creation of the first draft. This first draft was also open for, for consultation. And then we did some, some additional consultations with version 1.0. I am very glad to see Sarah McDuff here from IATI. Um, I think John Hawkins from, from Cost Initiative is also gonna, going to connect. Um, Befa that also gave a very specific inputs and the uh, MDTF team from the World Bank in this, in this particular moment gave a lot more inputs. So during this process, we've had the participation of nine ministries of finance, 16 civil society organizations, and 12 international organizations. And here you're included. Uh, we are really, really thankful for all these organizations that have been working on this because all of your inputs have been what has formed this guide. Um, we are observing the data standards available whenever possible. So that's why we also have uh, Lindsay and Catherine here from OCP uh, because of the procurement data that's standardized with open contracting data standards. So this is our methodology for development. Uh, according to the, the, the co-creation process, the structure of the guide is divided into three sections. The first one is about the user-centered and purpose-oriented approach of gathering data and publishing data. The second one is the identification of the required data. And the third one is uh, one that was added uh, after the first inputs uh, from one, version 1.0 to version 1.1. We now have this section of customization of the, in the guide and prioritization of data. So the user-centered and purpose-oriented approach has to do with a gifts focus that on meaningful publication that approaches the, the information to the user, whether it's from, from the general public or another public official 
or oversight institutions, but thinking about the user. Uh, we have a tutorial on this in case you're interested. And so we just mentioned this, we don't go in depth on, into this. Section two is, uh, I would say, the core of the guide. And it's the data sets and data fields that should be uh, gathered and published for any emergency and specifically for COVID-19. Um, these are uh, categorized in four dimensions. One is emergency and counter-cyclical spending, tax relief measures and deferrals, revenue adjustments and additional funding sources, and macroeconomic framework impact. Um, as you can see for emergency and counter-cyclical spending, it's not just about spending, it's about the emergency sp specific funds, looking at extra budgetary funds that might be uh, occurring, it's also about efficiency and effectiveness of the measures, mainly indicators, performance indicators. Um, then the specific subsidies, grants, support, and what's the criteria to receive it. The beneficiaries, because that's a, an important topic, who is benefiting from, from these grants that the government is giving. Um, public investments, considering that uh, some more investments are going to health facilities the payroll for medical staff, and of course, procurement, which is a very important topic, especially in these uh, moments of fast decision-making. Uh, tax relief measures and deferrals. And so we have the, the measures and referrals per se as first data set and beneficiaries of tax incentives. On the revenue side, uh, we are thinking of revenue adjustments and additional funding. So all the revenue adjustments that we are seeing because of the changes in the estimations of the global economy that are affecting the uh, tax revenues and also the natural resources revenues. The loans that countries are getting, which is an important topic, um, and other debt instruments. The external development and humanitarian resource flows. So thank you, Ayati, for participating in this one. And the trust funds and sovereign wealth funds and contingent tax collections, such as solidarity surcharge. Finally, it's the macroeconomic framework. This is not data sets, but rather a data series that we would be expecting and to see how this is impacting the macroeconomic framework as a whole. So overall, this is 15 data sets and 10, 10 time series that would help identify how the country is going. This is in total 374 data fields. Of course, this sounds like a lot. Um, and that's why we added the section three that talks about the customization of the guide and thinking about the country context and what is the data availability and quality of uh, the data. So thinking of what is the biggest effect in the country, this data should be prioritized and we should check on the quality of the data. Finally, there are some considerations of the availability and quality of the data for financial management information systems that uh, we should start preparing because it, this is not gonna be the last emergency. Unfortunately, we would like to say that, but this is not gonna be the last one. So we should start preparing our systems to gather this data, to have the data architecture that we need, to have the, the data fast, to make decisions and to publish it. We need to build, that's why uh, we decided to call this session Resilient Fiscal Transparency. So how do we build this architecture that will actually help us to be much more prepared next time? So the target of the audience is the ministries of finance. Of course, as you can see, we're thinking about how to improve data architecture and how to publish this data for civil society and advocacy groups so that you can prioritize data needs and approach governments to, um, to identify which data to gather and publish but also um, to follow up uh, which data do you want to monitor depending on your objectives. And finally, oversight institutions, of course, uh, that would like to know where is the data that they need for certain analysis. So that is the target audience for this guide. As you can see, this is a very, very practical guide 
meant for meant to be used by the ones here, the people here. So we are glad that you joined us. Uh, check out the guide. It should be available now in this address, uh, fiscaltransparency.net COVID-19. Okay, so that's that's our link. So, well, this is the presentation of the guide. I don't know if uh, Juan Paulo, you were, I would give it to you, the word. Or... Thank you, thank you. No, let's, let's follow the, the um, uh, order of um, uh, the sure. session. So we take advantage as much as possible of our, of our presenters. That's fine. Thank you. Excellent. So, okay, well, so thank you all for being here. And today, uh, so today we're discussing COVID, as you can see, and emergencies. So we have uh, four organizations, uh, five presenters that will answer four questions. Four very specific questions that have to do with fiscal openness and the learnings and challenges that they have seen during this uh, pandemic. So we have Catherine and Lindsay from Open Contracting Partnership. We have Sana, uh, Hanna Sonovic from the Ministry of Finance of Croatia. Uh, we have Michaela from the Institute of Public Finance of Croatia as well. And we have Richard Allen from the IMF. What we're going to do and the dynamics of this session is uh, very particular because we want to make it very dynamic for you to interact and give your own perspectives. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pose the question and then I'm going to give the floor to each of our presenters today, to the four that you see here. Um, they're going to answer the same question so that you can see different perspectives from the same question. And then we're going to a breakout room. Then we're gonna come back from the breakout rooms and then uh, and they're going to report back on what you discussed. After this, I'm going to post the second question and we're gonna do the same dynamic. We're gonna go on to breakout rooms and then they're going to report back on the discussions. We're gonna do this three times and then we're going to finish with some reflections from our wonderful presenters and um, hopefully we go uh, knowing more and having new ideas after today. So thank you for this. So. The first question, it's um, a question that has to do completely with what we're doing here. And the first question is, uh, what has worked well in holding or improving transparency in the context of COVID-19? We've heard some complicated stories from some countries, so we wanted to ask this from our presenters. So. Please, Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lorena. Um, I'm Catherine uh, from the Open Contracting Partnership, and I'm here with my colleague, Lindsay. And um, as our name says, we work on how to make uh, public contracting and public procurement more effective, equitable, and transparent. And um, we are pleased to be here with you and uh, learn from all of you in this session and more generally, uh, we always enjoy working with GIFT because procurement and budget uh, really has to come together to improve uh, fiscal transparency and accountability. So what have we learned uh, in the last uh, four months uh, on how to improve transparency in this context? And for us, as you probably have seen as well, is that public procurement really matters. Um, when you read the newspapers, I feel like every day now, there's a story about contracting gone wrong where, you know, uh, essential supplies were not delivered or were delivered in the wrong quantity or at very high uh, prices and the ones who really suffer are the citizens and often marginalized communities. Um, so that's the downside when procurement goes wrong. But we have also learned uh, since March that when there is a country that has open emergency procurement that invests in coordination across agencies and uses data and tax them, Along the lines that um, we just heard from Rolena, Lorena, how it is described in the in the data guide, um, you can 
handle emergencies more efficiently and more transparently with better results. So for us, the last four months have shown that countries that invest in open contracting practices and in open contracting data were able to buy and deliver essential COVID contracts better than other countries. And we have seen that in countries such as Colombia, Ecuador, Moldova, Paraguay, and Ukraine, and some of you are here, part of this session, and um, in the opening session, many of the countries that we work on um, were also part, and uh, we have that shared understanding. But we also understand, right, that in some countries, as Lorena said, you just don't have this data architecture yet, or maybe the governments are not able to coordinate and uh, do these uh, procedures more openly. So in those cases, we have seen that if there's a very active civil society, if there are journalists that know how to monitor procurement, that know how to connect budgets to procurement and use the data to hold their governments accountable, that they can also see effects, that they have been able to call out corruption, that they have been able to flag uh, risks and get responses from their governments. So uh, again, to answer the question, we have seen that open contracting uh, really works, and uh, that would be our main takeaway. And um, in the chat, uh, I can share a quick memo or short memo that we wrote about this in case you want to learn more about it. That is great. Um, yeah, open contracting is always very prepared with sharing their, their content. So please uh, click on them. They're always very insightful. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Open contracting is an important thing. So now we're go to you richard what has worked well in improving or holding transparency thank you very much lorraine i'm very happy to be here and congratulations on producing your new guide on fiscal data for emergency responses i'm very pleased to see that that important work has come to a conclusion or near conclusion um, so a few points from me um, first of all what is working well I think, uh, first of all, fiscal transparency features now very prominently on the agenda of the governments and development partners. And I think there's been a huge change since the global financial crisis of 2008. Transparency really now is important. And I think there's also the beginnings of an important dialogue between governments, the IFIs, including the, the IMF, and civil society groups. I think that's another very important uh, thing that's working well. Uh, the second thing I'd mention is the IMF's Fiscal Transparency Code, which has become, I think, widely recognized as an international standard. And fiscal transparency evaluations have now been carried out in more than 32, 30 countries. And most of these have been published. So that's, that's an important trend. More Fiscal transparency value could be done, particularly, I think, in developing countries. The third thing I'd mentioned briefly is that several countries have improved their open budget survey scores, countries like South Africa, Mexico, Georgia, and Brazil, and several others now exceed the 61 out of 100 points uh, minimum benchmark. So that has improved. I think the scope for further improvement, but, but it's on a rising trend. And then I think, what about the IMF's focus on fiscal transparency in response to the crisis? Well, the managing director uh, set out a speech focusing on keeping the receipts. And that got a lot of attention in the, in the media. And what she meant by that was keeping the receipts in relation to the design of programs, the implementation, and the oversight of COVID related intervention. So that idea of keeping the receipts and not throwing them away or hiding them, very important for transparency. We're also producing a series of special notes on COVID related topics and I'd encourage you to read those. We've also done PFM blogs on many of these notes and they cover things such as fiscal rules, cash management, digitization, public investment management, corruption. There's one coming out today which I participated in on extra budgetary funds, business continuity and also stuff on the revenue administration side. So a lot of special notes advising countries how to respond to the, the crisis. 
Uh, we're also producing a policy tracker in the Fiscal Affairs de Department and a lot of fiscal information on COVID-related uh, interventions. And of course, the fund is also providing a lot of financial support uh, through uh, special programs, which include transparency measures, encouraging countries to do ex post audits of their responses and to have transparent procurement measures. I was interested in the previous presentation on, on the open contracting partnership. And of course, there's your own guide, which is coming out today, and the open contracting partnerships guide on open procurement. These are very, very important documents. So let me stop there and pass on to the next presenter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Actually, you're going to see on the guide, these special notes were a great asset. They're super useful. I think most of them are not more than 13, 15 pages most, very practical as well. So, uh, exactly. and so now we're going to Hannah. She's going to tell us a bit about of how this is being handled in Croatia. Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you for inviting me uh, to tell you how did Croatia uh, cope with uh, this uh, horrible crisis. Uh, just to give you an um, overview, uh, situation prior to COVID-19 in Croatia was quite good uh, because Croatian GDP growth was accelerating finally and unemployment was uh, pretty low and we ran the government budget uh, surplus of uh, 0 0.9 of GDP. The one important thing is that Croatian economy strongly relies on the tourism sector, which represents around 25% of the GDP, uh, what uh, make, made us uh, cope even more difficult uh, with the uh, corona crisis uh, this summer. Uh, on the next slide, you can see that uh, not only that uh, uh, we had a crisis of uh, COVID-19 uh, that was throughout the whole world, but actually in Croatia on March 22, during the partial lockdown, we had an earthquake of uh, 5.3 magnitude, the strongest one in the last 140 years that struck uh, Croatia's uh, capital Zagreb and damaging a lot of buildings and injuring uh, dozens of people. So at the at the same time, we had a natural disaster and a health crisis, and we needed to uh, cope uh, with uh, both of these. Uh, I would say that for the Ministry of Finance, the most difficult thing to cope with was that we had a crisis on the revenue side and on the expenditure side. On one side, you're not getting uh, enough revenues as you used to. On the other side, you need to uh, spend more, you need to uh, manage the health cri crisis and the natural disaster that just happened. So for us, I would say it was a uh, quite demanding uh, period. And and of course, uh, the thing that was uh, uh, pretty uh, difficult for us, it was that we had to act really quickly and we had to uh, uh, act um, in um, like a live streaming and you have to make decisions uh, in uh, five minutes time uh, uh, sometimes. In all of that, you have to be very careful about the tr transparency and the participation of, of all the stakeholders and uh, giving all the possible data that you can, you can give uh, through the all, to all of the stakeholders. Uh, so in Croatia, we had uh, a lot of measures that we adopted uh, to help the economy due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I, uh, won't be go to, I won't be going through all of these, but I will show you on two measures uh, how did this reflect on the transparency issue. So first uh, of the measures was the measure for functioning of the public finance system and the sustainability of, of the public service financing. Uh, the second one, and I would say maybe the uh, most important one, was aid for job uh, pr uh, preservation. Then we had uh, some horizontal measures like deferment and write-off of payments of direct taxes and contributions to entrepreneurs with business difficulties. And here it was quite difficult because some of these revenues are directly revenues of the local governments. So we had to cope with this also, how to help local governments because uh, in this time uh, they will have also uh, lower revenues. 
we had measurements that were aimed at micro, small and medium sized enter enterprises. And I must say that we here had help from the EU. Uh, so in this crisis, uh, it was shown uh, very clearly that uh, it's much easier when you are a part of something bigger, of some bigger organization like uh, EU, when uh, you can all join together and help uh, each other in these kind of situations. Uh, and we had, of course, uh, the special accounts dedicating, uh, dedicated uh, to collection of donations to uh, assist uh, uh, COVID, but also the earthquake, uh, and also in a very transparent way. Uh, so when we are talking about measures for functioning of the public finance system, uh, here at the Ministry of Finance, we had to act very, ver ver we had to act very fast. So we. Uh, couldn't go to the amendments of the budget uh, first day. So uh, what we did was that we did the amend amendments of the law on budget execution. So uh, we changed the law on the budget execution that enabled us uh, additional borrowing uh, for the states above the amounts that we usually in the normal year have. And also, um, provisions that enabled us to reallocate the, in the state budget uh, some things uh, concerning the COVID. Uh, so this was like uh, some measure that we did before the amendments of the budget. And I have to say that we weren't one of the countries that had this uh, extra funds uh, regarding the COVID. So all the funds went through the budget in a very transparent way uh, because uh, we had uh, we have special classifications in the budget. And by using this classification, you can identify all the money that goes for the activities concerning uh, the measures related to, to COVID. Uh, in May 2020, we had the amendments to the budget, and so the parliament uh, was uh, uh, voted on the amendments to the budget. Uh, these reallocations that I said that, that were higher for the COVID uh, uh, activities were also um, going to the government. So each of these uh, higher reallocations had to be approved by the government and put on their website so you can see where the money goes. Um, first thing that was, uh, that was introduced was uh, the uh, so-called um, Mm, uh, web page uh, regarding the coronavirus uh, that uh, was the special page uh, from the government of Croatia. Also, there is a Facebook page by the government of Croatia that is aimed at the younger population where you can uh, see all the information related uh, to COVID-19. And there were daily press conferences uh, that were live streamed uh, by the civil protection headquarters who was in charge in Croatia uh, in managing the crisis uh, regarding uh, the health. On the side of Ministry of Finance, we also provided all the data to this uh, Corona uh, Crisis Hire web page, uh, but also additional uh, data on our web page. Uh, in uh, one of the measures that we also adopted was the measures uh, for the uh, aid for job preservation. Uh, this was very important because um, all the entrepreneurs who had difficulties regarding the COVID crisis uh, could uh, use this aid for job preservation. Here, it was really, really important to have it all transparent. So every month we uh, publish the data about the end users who are using these uh, measures, who are using the funds from the state budget by the firm. So now you can go to the web page and you can see list of all end users by name of alph alphabetically per month. So you can see the exact amount that some firm uh, received from the state budget uh, to uh, preserve uh, the job, uh, the jobs. Uh, important thing to stress here is that these, all of these data are also available in open data, data format on the web page, so you can uh, reuse them. Uh, also, all the uh, uh, 
uh, how to say, for this measure, you had uh, certain conditions. All of these conditions, how you can apply, were also publicly available, and you can uh, access them uh, on, on, on uh, the daily basis. So uh, this was the, on the pages of Croatian Employment Agency, but also there was a link on this Corona crisis web page, and of course on the link on the Ministry of Finance uh, web page. Uh, so I would say there is a lot, lot, lot of measures that I could be talking now, but I would say that uh, although decisions were uh, taken uh, very fast and on a daily uh, basis, we uh, tried to uh, have as uh, transparent as possible all the data. And I would say maybe I'm a little bit subjective, but I think uh, we managed this uh, as much as we could. Thank you, Hannah. So uh, it's a case that exemplifies why we wanted to call the fiscal data for emergency responses because we don't just have coronavirus, we are constantly having emergencies, as you can see in the case of, F of Croatia. Um, and then we go, if, if you can answer this question, Mihaela, what has worked well in holding or improving transparency in the current context of COVID-19? Uh, hi everybody, I'm Mikhail Bronic, I'm from Institute of Public Finance from Croatia. I hope that you can hear me because my internet is unstable. I hope that you can hear me. Uh, um, so uh, I'm working in the Institute of Public Finance, which is a public research institute, and we do research in uh, public sector economics. So we were also analyzing the transfiscal transparency in the uh, relating to COVID-19 responses. And uh, what I think, uh, these are a few examples that worked very well in Croatia. What was very good, that was uh, that we had online, as, Anna, as Hannah said, a detailed explanation of, of most of, of emergency measures and how to apply for them. And I think the citizens were very pleased with this and especially with the fact that they could quickly apply for emergency measure, measures. This, this was done very well, actually. Uh, there were two most important measures. One is tax relief, uh, tax relief for uh, entrepreneurs, and the other was job preservation measure. And the uh, citizens could apply online, and these, uh, they could get benefits very quickly, like in a few days they were granted benefits. And I know from several people that they were very pleased with this because they are not used to uh, applying online and having very simplified procedures to get some benefits. So uh, another thing that uh, Hannah already mentioned and that I think that is very important is that uh, uh, the, uh, actually that, uh, that um, Croatian Employment uh, Institute, they published uh, uh, in a uh, complete release of the beneficiary registry of this support for job preservation measures. Uh, Hannah already mentioned this. And this is, um, all, she said that all entrepreneurs that uh, were given this uh, benefits, uh, they are listed monthly in uh, online. And it, this is very important because uh, it uh, helps, uh, uh, I think it helps government, but it helps also citizens to have better control of the measure that was given. For example, there was a problem after the first uh, uh, month that this uh, registry was uh, published, that actually some of the entrepreneurs were giving dividends uh, at the same time that they were receiving this benefit. So this was in the newspapers, and as I know later, uh, government corrected this measure, so they have introduced, uh, uh, they, they added, uh, like in, in this uh, measure, they introduced that uh, the person that, or entrepreneur who is receiving this measure cannot uh, at the same time uh, um, give dividends or pay dividends. For example, so, so I think it, it was very important that uh, uh, the measures were uh, explained detailed online and uh, that the 
the, the beneficial residual uh, problem. That is great. It's uh, very concrete suggestions that Michael is already giving us. Um, we see different levels of, uh, of transparency on the measures, and that's uh, sometimes a complication. So now we wanted to go into breakout rooms. Uh, Albertina is going to take us to breakout rooms. Uh, we're going to have uh, Lindsay and Catherine together in one. We're going to have, I think, Michaela and Hannah in another one. And we're going to have Richard and, uh, and I guess you're going to be with me, Richard, in another one. And um, you're going to have 10 minutes so that you can share what you see that has worked well in holding or improving transparency in the current context of COVID-19. So... We want to hear from you and since we're a lot, we thought that it's better in breakout rooms in smaller groups. So Albertina, whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. Thank you. So welcome back everyone. I think we have everyone here or almost everyone. So now it's time for, sorry, for the ones who needed the instructions, I missed sharing with you the instructions for joining the breakout groups. For the ones who missed how to enter uh, and clicked on later, you can join after on, on uh, clicking with the controls and be sure to ask for help in case you're lost. So, okay, so it's time to report back. Um, Catherine, can you share with us what you discussed, what has worked well in holding or improving transparency? Of course, I'm, I'm glad to share. So first we heard an example from South Africa and Gambia uh, from one of your colleagues from IDP, who again shared that um, if you don't have the government, you know, who can do as much uh, civil society monitoring and also journalists who do investigations can be very effective in, in spotting uh, corruption or flags and increasing uh, the accountability. Uh, then we heard from Paula in, in Uruguay uh, that they uh, had a special fund uh, for COVID-related measures and they're about to publish a portal that will show information um, from the fund uh, in user-friendly ways uh, for citizens but also for other um, government agencies. And then um, Croatia and uh, Uruguay had a, a nice exchange of what worked for each of them. So I think uh, that was exactly what you hope to do with this session. And then from our side, Lindsay was able to share an example from Paraguay that also used a special fund and was still able to tag the information there with COVID related um, information. And uh, that might be something that inspires um, other participants. Let me see if anyone wants to add anything especially my fellow facilitators from Croatia. <laughs> All good, thanks. So thank you. Um, over to you, Richard. Uh, can you unmute, Richard, please? Unmute. There we there go. There you go. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Quickly from from my group, interesting group, different views, um, and I think um, from Nigeria we had a very interesting report. There's a lot of demand for information. Uh, a huge amount of public meetings taking place on the crisis. Um, Dial-in hotlines. Uh, and very active social media. So civil society in this part of Africa seems to be very heavily involved. Um, 
and um, getting quite good responses from the government, both at the federal level and at the state level. So that's a very, a very good picture. Also had some uh, feedback from Latin America, from the Open Data Charter in Argentina. Um, some countries are doing a lot of very good things to publish information. Uh, Colombia was mentioned as an example where they have open data portals and other countries are also doing a lot on open data portals, including Paraguay, Argentina uh, and Chile, and also at the municipality level, for example, in Buenos Aires. So a lot of good uh, stuff there, but also some comments that some governments in Latin America are not really responding very actively. These are some of the less democratic uh, countries in the region are not responding so, so, so rapidly. So uh, I think those are some of the reactions I got. And it seemed from my earlier, from the earlier presentations, for example, in Croatia, that the government's doing a lot to give explanations of the, um, the emergency measures, to speed up applications uh, for, for grants and assistance, uh, and also to develop beneficiary registries, a very important point. So in, in some of the European countries, that seems to be working quite well. I'll stop there. Thank you, Richard. Uh, it's important insights. On the French group, uh, Claire, Juan Pablo, can you please report back on the group? We, we decided uh, to ask Diodoné. Oh, okay, great. Because he's here with us. He's, uh, he's gonna be reporting back and uh, speaking French. So please uh, put yourselves on the, the English channels. Diodoné, vous êtes là? On vous écoute. Je suis là. Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. What we uh, discussed was uh, the experience of Benin and Senegal. In Benin, when the pandemic hit, a technical management committee was established. And this was a committee that included the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of of finance to manage resources and also the departments uh, in charge of emergency management and other ministry partners were all part of this uh, team. Unfortunately, civil society was not represented, but I can confirm, verify, but I think that's what they said, that civil society was not represented on this committee. And as the resources were being allocated, and they were given as they were being allocated to people and to partners who were requiring funds. They would come together regularly uh, to uh, talk about which resources were being allocated, what was being spent, uh, who was getting the resources. So these were regular update, updates and then major purchases that were made in terms of masks, uh, personal protection equipment, uh, breathing uh, ventilators, breathing equipment, pharmaceutical products, all these major uh, procurements uh, were also published. So there was a regular uh, dissemination of information uh, by this committee of the expenses and purchases made. And then the revenues that were allocated have practically uh, exceeded the Ministry of Health's entire budget. Uh, that is to say, what they've spent to manage this crisis has basically uh, been more than their actual national budget for the Ministry of Health. Now in Senegal, the experience that they had in Senegal was that they worked closely with social, civil society, generally speaking. Uh, they had a committee that was helping to manage this crisis and civil society was involved in the committee. And it was basically a similar management strategy that they used as well. Uh, so I, I, I was a little bit fast. I'm not sure if the interpreter was able to keep up with me, but that's what I wanted to present. Thank you. 
So this was very insightful as well because we have another aspect from a different region. Uh, so we've heard three perspectives and then okay. you get a lot more uh, time to chat. We're going to have the next session. So I asked our presenters to also share their perspective on a difficult subject. What do you wish you had known or done before to have more resilient fiscal transparency? So this is a bit of, uh, I've asked them to reflect well on this because it's things that we would like to have uh, changed to be prepared or we notice things that come up after. So Catherine. I think I'm going to take this one from OCP. Hi, okay. everyone. Okay. Okay, Lindsay. I'm Lindsay from Lindsay Marshall, so from the Open Contracting Partnership. So, yes, what do what do we wish, or what do we wish our partners had known or done uh, before COVID to have more resilient fiscal transparency? And what we've learned uh, through the crisis is that the countries who already had strong embedded open contracting principles, processes and practices were able to adapt much more quickly. Uh, so I think in the memo Catherine shared, we, we put some examples from Paraguay, Colombia, Moldova, Ecuador, and those include some, some really nice uh, visualizations, dashboards, applications, uh, monitoring the COVID response, enabling research, ena enabling feedback, enabling accountability. Uh, but these things did not happen overnight. They are the culmination of years of work to improve uh, joint, to improve data quality, to improve data sharing, to improve data publication, uh, to put governance uh, in place to engage uh, the media, civil society, different stakeholders in using this information, uh, engaging uh, the civic tech community. So there was definitely a history that went went into that. So that shows us that in order to be prepared for future, future emergencies, it helps to get uh, some of the uh, institutional setups uh, right. And how do we do that? Um, wh what we need to do is really build multi-stakeholder engagement and support for strong fiscal transparency uh, because you can have one champion but if they change then it's very difficult or if the government changes it's very difficult uh, to preserve the gains across administrations so having wide widespread support from inside and outside government is very important including strong stakeholders like the IMF and World Bank and and others um, it helps to have political leadership uh, so people who are really dedicated to, to ensuring that these reforms happen and being vocal and communicating about the importance of these types of reforms. Ultimately, you need people who are willing to use this uh, fiscal transparency information. So you need data users, or what we might call infomediaries. These can be journalists, these can be civil society organizations, this can be government <laughs> itself uh, trying to explain, you know, why this information is important and how it can be used uh, to ensure accountability and oversight. And uh, then of course you need the actual nuts and bolts of how you're gonna collect this information, how you're going to ensure uh, its validity, its accuracy, and how you're gonna get that uh, into the hands of people. And that usually requires some normative uh, mandates. So maybe some laws, regulations, uh, policies of some kind. And of course, uh, as with any reform, you need change management so that everybody who's working on this or whose uh, work is touched by this understands why it's important and uh, values uh, the contribution of fiscal transparency to their work. <clears throat> Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, it's true. It's about uh, creating the data architecture as a whole, and it's not overnight. Uh, Richard, please. Uh, thank you very much, Lorena. And uh, I'll be very brief on, on this one. I mean, I think... Um, the sheer scale and length of the pandemic took us by surprise. I remember in our office, we were thinking we'd all be back in June when, when it started, but certainly we'll, we'll, we are not, and we will not be back for, for many months yet. So the scale and length of the pandemic uh, has been a total surprise for everyone. And the scale of the financial operations, I think it's $10 trillion of operations, for example, in the G20 countries alone. So. All that I think we, we would have done better if we'd known that in advance. In advance, um, 
I think the second thing I would say is the experience of dealing with such a large and multifaceted crisis, both financially and logistically. I mean, the need for business continuity plans. I mean, countries have been rem working remotely. Um, we've been working remotely in the IMF, the World Bank has, and all the other donor agencies. And the, the problems and challenges of ensuring continuity of business, I think has been very challenging. We've managed it, I think, uh, but we're still working on it and there are other issues still to resolve. And uh, also the uh, emergency procedures and emergency legislation, the kind of things <clears throat> that governments were going to do, the kind of things that we in the IMF have been doing in terms of support, financial support, <clears throat> it would have been good to have known this in advance. Of course, we couldn't. And the, the challenges of delivering technical assistance support remotely. Again, we've been learning. I think we do it quite well now, but for the first couple of months, we were really struggling to think, how are we going to do this uh, remotely without having actual missions to countries? So this has been a challenge. I think another point is the recognition that speedy implementation of these emergency measures does not require abandoning fiscal controls. You really have to focus on fiscal control and accountability, even though it's important to get emergency measures out quickly. This is something we've, we've been discussing a lot in our work with other countries. And that increasing the flexibility of providing support, uh, for example, through the procurement systems, that requires enhanced accountability. And of course, above all, that transparency is a paramount. I mean, really in the crisis like this, Transparency is paramount. Countries have been trying to deal with this. There are lots of challenges that, that remain as we're discussing today. And I think a final point I'd make, we've already mentioned, is the importance of having a stronger role with civil society groups as allies to support more effective measures uh, in improving transparency. This, I think, is a critical link which we're all uh, determined to work on further in the next months. I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, it's, uh, a lot to do and a lot of lessons learned. Um, Michaela, please. Thank you. I will actually um, say something very similar to what Lindsay and Richard already said. Uh, what we realized, realized is that is very, that actually the most, probably the most important part of all is fiscal transparency. And uh, that actually we realized, we realized that we needed to push more in normal times, that it is important to identify, collect, consolidate, and publish data required uh, for, to achieve greater uh, for fiscal transparency in normal, normal times. For example, if we had, in Croatia, we don't have published tax expenditures, but if we had them published in uh, uh, normal times, it would be easier for a government to publish uh, tax benefits in times of crisis. And uh, we, I think we should push more that the data that is published, financial data that is published, should be user-centered. It means we, uh, we, we have numerous uh, users of those, but those data, and the government should ask users what data they want to the data should also be timely and understandable. And I see this, say that because in Croatia, we usually, and in many other countries, we have numerous data that are published, but the problem is there is no metadata and there are no narratives. And, usually, and, and citizens and researchers and parliamentarians, they cannot handle this data. And uh, it should be very good that the data is published in one place. Um, there should be one contact person that could help users to find the data and use the data. And in Croatia, we have actually, it is prescribed by the Freedom of Information Act that uh, all public bodies, bodies should uh, publish their data sets on the open government portal. Croatia has open government portal. But the problem is that in that uh, freedom of information law, it is not prescribed that there are any penalties. So almost no public bodies are publishing their data sets on the, on the, on the open government um, portal, open data portal. 
So I actually wanted just to say that uh, um, that uh, this, uh, I think it is important to push for more transparency in normal times, so it will be easier to be transparent in the times of crisis. It's uh, really important. This is, has to do a lot with what Lindsay just mentioned. Um, so now we would like to hear from you on this uh, session on this regard from the people here. So Albertina is going to send you to the breakout rooms again. Um, we had a few shifts. You, we might have a um, Many presenters in one of the breakout groups were, that's because we had uh, the representation of the French speakers, but yeah, so. Yeah. And remember to, to, to click on join when you are splitting rooms, so you can join the room, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Okay, here we go. Welcome back, everyone. I think we have a yeah, few yeah. questions on here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, please. Uh, so now we have <laughs> another type of groups. We're sorry uh, with our presenters and facilitators of the group since we had to adapt because we had the French speaking group and we have less uh, people than registered. But uh, from, from our group, uh, Hannah is going to be the reporter. Hannah. Uh, hello, everybody, once again. So in our group, uh, we discussed a little bit about uh, transparency versus accountability and how some of uh, the countries need to work on filling this gap. So you have a lot of data and everything is transparent, but who is accountable for it and how much it's not the same how much is known and uh, how much people are accountable for something. Uh, this was the first thing. The second thing that we talked about was uh, about using the data, uh, how, who is using the data, uh, what are people using data for. So uh, there was a point on civil society who has to be a little bit more active because all the ministries of finance already have a lot of load of work uh, regarding the data, but the civil society should uh, see uh, what is the data that is needed and then help and be a partner to the ministry of finance in uh, uh, tackling uh, what are these important data and uh, what are pe what are people using this data for and the third thing that we talked about is actually how there is a lot of data sets uh, but there is no uh, all the data on one place so Lorena stressed uh, very uh, very good uh, in a very good way that uh, you have all uh, this good data. So you have the end users, the amounts, uh, all these details, but it's on fragmented uh, places. It's on a lot of different places. But my opinion was that this is uh, further steps that we have to take and we are going, to, going there. And as long as we are going, it's good. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah, it's a it's a big part. And just to share, we have been working a lot on opening the data and talking about the opening of the data. But then when something like this happens, we notice even more that we don't have the centralized data bases that we would like to have uh, to publish like this. On, on the <coughs> other group, I see a, Richard, are you the, are you reporting? Yes, I can do that. Thank you. Can you, hear you can hear me, yeah? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, I think we had some of the same issues in our group. I think there was a lot of emphasis on the importance of data. I think we, if, in retrospect, it would be nice to have been able to plan for this, to make sure the data are timely, understandable, and published in one place. I think um, we continue to struggle with that, but that that's a key area. Wish we'd known more done some things before, but it's easy to be wise after the event, of course, as in all these situations. You're never prepared for crises like this. 
So I think that's one, one thing. The other thing we discussed a bit was the tools that we now are using to uh, manage the crisis, uh, such as, uh, you know, the, the Zoom facilities, WebEx, WhatsApp, social media, all these things have developed enormously. We've all learned in the IMF how to use these tools. We hardly ever used them before. Now they're part of the general tapestry of our working life. So I think that's another thing, tools, with which we wish we'd been better prepared. We've learned fast, but we, you know, for the first couple of months, it was a real struggle. Uh, I think uh, remote working, another huge challenge. We've all got used to working at home, uh, to dealing with governments that are largely working at home. Um, but again, it would have been nice to have prepared for that and been ready for it. But of course, it's easy to be wise after the event. And we're still learning about how to, uh, to do remote working. So I think those are some of the main issues which uh, we discussed. There was a question at the end from the lady from Nigeria who said, what do you think will remain after the crisis is over? And this is not a question on your agenda, but you know, this is a very important question. I think a lot of our current working practices and use of technology will remain after the crisis. I don't think we'll go back to business as normal, whatever normal means now. Uh, and um, that's another very interesting question which relates to the one you've asked here. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And now we go with Didonet. Um, and I was also going to ask, and I will go back to you, Catherine and Lindsay, if you want something to say something as well. Okay. Uh, merci beaucoup. Euh, nous avons trouvé qu'en cette période, on peut avoir euh, quelques moyens de transparence et de redevabilité, mais euh, ça transparency. Va... Uh, and it can be difficult because we don't go out, we don't meet people. Communications are challenging. We insisted on communications based on facts, scientific facts, real facts. In fact, instructions must come from the government, but following and monitoring these instructions and their implementation can be done by the public. The public must make sure that everyone follows these instructions in the schools, in the markets and different centers and all of that, because in Benin there was not, there were not strict restrictions. There were some barriers that needed to be complied with. So the population needs to mobilize to make sure that these barrier measures are respected. There is free communication between the government and public actors and actors in civil society I think that we can take advantage of this good collaboration to ask for certain things from the government. We have insisted that we must not forget those who are marginalized, marginalized people with disabilities. The interpreter apologized, the speaker is no longer audible. Connection okay. seems to have been dro dropped. Okay. Uh, we emphasize it uh, well just to make sure that uh, it is uh, registered how important it is for next crisis to be sure that response take into consideration marginalized uh, and uh, disadvantaged population thank you uh, thank claire you. i might be forget i might be forgetting something claire no, I, I, I think that's great. Okay. Thank you. We have been, we can share examples from Senegal too, because we've had good chat conversations here too. We can share them uh, in the notes. Thanks. And Catherine and Lindsay from the group, I am not sure if you had anything else to add. No? Okay, so we're going to our third question. 
So what new ideas can we try in order to improve fiscal transparency in similar contexts? What should we try? What should we change? So open contracting. All right. So one of the, the first things we reflected on when we read the question was the idea of similar contexts. And I think what we've learned through this crisis is that the context in which we're living are so different. And so really the solutions are going to look different in, in different contexts. Um, and you know, we were reflecting on that in the last breakup group with breakout group where in some places the pivot to working from home was much more seamless and others internet connectivity is just not a day-to-day -day reality for most people at home. So there really are um, different, more offline solutions that need to be explored in some places uh, versus others. Um, but what one of the, some of the things that we think do carry across to some of the different contexts are um, that the multi-stakeholder engagement is so important to identify the priorities and push for transparency because especially in contexts where uh, the systems were not already in place and it's going to be much more of a starting from scratch situation to try to uh, implement fiscal transparency for the COVID emergency. Uh, it's going to be really important to identify what is the most important pieces of information that we need to uh, make sure that we are collecting, that we are publishing, uh, and that we are sharing. And then uh, we've also seen how uh, helpful it is to have basic uh, spreadsheet input templates. So, you know, simple spreadsheets that people can use to start to actually collect data where there aren't uh, already systems and databases in place. And uh, this can also be uh, implemented as something like a Google form uh, if needed. And we've also seen that the information needs to be usable for the stakeholders who can drive accountability in the local context. So that might be journalists, that might be auditors, you know, there are different players in, in each context who can be drivers of accountability. And it's important that the way that information is collected and published is usable by them and for their purposes. So having them involved in those identifications of priorities and the push for transparency is very important. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, Richard, same question. What ideas do we have to improve? Thank you very much, uh, Lorena. So a few ideas here. I mean, I think uh, there are lots of ideas in the special notes that we've published over the past three or four months. Uh, these are just a few ideas I've picked out for my three minutes. Um, First of all, I think uh, the blending of private and public sources of emergency financing, this has not worked well in some countries. They've struggled to blend together private and public sources of finance. Uh, and uh, ways need to be found of ensuring that the budget system can accommodate uh, these different sources of financing. And also the tracking of COVID related spending through budget systems. Uh, some countries have continued to struggle with have proper tracking and monitoring of COVID spending. Very important for a transparency point of view and from an audit point of view. And I think, uh, again, on the second point, the role of external auditors in responding to the crisis uh, could be improved. Their powers could be increased. Uh, and laws uh, included to audit emergency spending. There are some very interesting mechanisms being developed for interim audits and concurrent audits in countries like Sierra Leone and Honduras. And I think those could be uh, explored further in other countries. Uh, thirdly, I think more work can be done on disclosing information on the beneficial ownership of contracts. Not many countries do this. Uh, and I think this is something being advocated by the open ownership group and something we in the IMF strongly support, information on the ultimate ownership of contracts awarded to companies. Um, very important from transparency point of view. A fourth point, I think, is to make better use of digital technologies to improve transparency. For example, in distributing cash transfers to companies and vulnerable groups, and also the use of e-procurement systems 
and open information portals. Again, I think some countries have moved rapidly on this, but more progress could be made. And some of our special notes have discussed the issues in, in that area. Uh, a fifth point is for less obfuscation in the presentation of documents reporting on emergency spending and other measures. Budget documents, audit reports, other official publications are often quite impenetrable. And I think uh, more simple language, clear language, would help communicate messages to the public. And I think the civil society organizations can help uh, in this particular area. It seems to be very important. And a final point, uh, which is um, uh, discussed in a, in a special note being published today by the IMF, is to improve the governance, reporting and oversight of the more than 40 extra budgetary funds that have been set up worldwide to manage emergency spending. The World Health Organization has done some very interesting work on this and many of these funds are, very, are not uh, transparent, not accountable uh, and operate in a large degree of secrecy. So I think improving the governance and reporting of these funds which is done by, as I say, more than 40 countries, uh, is another very important idea that should be developed further. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. And now we go with the same question, Michaela. What new ideas do we have? Thank you, Dean. I will try to be short. And these are actually not very new ideas, and, uh, and they are partly covered in the GIFT uh, fiscal data for emergency response guide for COVID-19 that Lorena mentioned on, uh, at the beginning of this session. And I think it is important to emphasize that uh, uh, for the improvement of fiscal transparency in similar contexts, it would be very important to identify collect, consolidate, and publish the data requ require, required to achieve greater fiscal transparency uh, relating to emergency responses. Example, for example, we could collect data relating to tax relief measures, tax deferrals that are um, aimed for uh, as emergency responses. And the data should be timely, relevant, and what is very important, it should be understandable to citizens. And it would be very important what we mentioned before to develop one central place uh, to timely and understandably disclose this fiscal information because citizens are uh, sometimes losing themselves and they cannot, the, the data is somewhere there, out there, but they cannot find it. So it's very important that there is one central place that they can uh, go and find those that data. Well, thank you. Um. There are things that I think we have discussed less and we see less of on the extra budgetary funds indeed that Richard was mentioning. But also in this that you were just saying, tax relief measures and refer deferrals, what we see mostly with the countries that we're working with is there's not, not even a consolidation of how, how many there are. So this is for the crisis, but usually it's not something that, uh, or many ministries of finance do not have yet. So it's an important thing that you mentioned here. Um, I would like to ask the ones who are here, they have any questions for our presenters now. You can raise your hands if you please. And otherwise, I think I can go to the fourth question, we're going to skip the breakout rooms uh, for the sake of time as well, since we are a bit over time. Um, this, the fourth question, after six or seven months that we have been on this, I, I know when I sent this to you, it was a five or six, but this time is, uh, the time is running. So after six, seven months into this experience, what unanswered questions remain related to fiscal transparency, fiscal openness in general? Lindsay. Six or seven months, it feels like years. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so um, 
I think that some of the so some of the questions, although I'm really curious to hear what other people have to say, are you know what are going to be the most effective strategies in contexts where there are going to be more continued disruptions and lower capacity. And when I say lower capacity, I mean in terms of IT connectivity, in terms of the um, the, the the availability existence of data and of the capacities of of people to to be able to work on this. Uh, so what you know what strategies are going to work um, in some of the more challenging contexts uh, and also how can we use procurement as a lever to promote greater inclusion and equity in the recovery so crises can be a great opportunity for reform and what we have now with the COVID crisis is a need, you know, budgets and revenues are probably going to be strapped more than ever. So we need every uh, bit of public money to count in terms of delivering a public benefit. But also, you know, the goal is not just to deliver services, but the goal is to rebuild our economies. And so how can we ensure that the contracts that are given as part of this effort uh, go to a more equitable representation of our populations uh, and not necessarily uh, only the small group of um, connected uh, individuals and companies. So there is a really good opportunity here to make equity and inclusion a focus of the recovery and the procurement uh, in the recovery. And then what are going to be the long term consequences and fiscal transparency solutions for the large amount of debts that countries are acquiring. So I think that that's a really big open question that um, will make it even more important. Uh, what I was saying earlier about uh, being efficient and effective uh, with our with our limited public funds, but really curious to see what others are thinking about. Well, we have other perspectives and that's, uh, yeah, so Richard. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and interesting comments there on, 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 on the, pre the previous uh, slide. I, li I like those a lot. So a few questions from, from my side. Uh, there are many others, of course, but here are a few. Um, first one will be how should countries report comprehensively on their COVID 19 responses. I think the, the situation on that front is still that few countries are reporting comprehensively uh, and there's let, insufficient information getting, getting into the public domain on the COVID related expenditures and tax measures. So I think that's to me a very important question which links to improved transparency and accountability. Uh, a second question, I think, is, uh, is that we can continue to work on building more flexibility and results focus into our technical assistance activities and learning how to work remotely with countries. Uh, that's a, a challenge we're facing every day in the IMF and we continue to have to work on that. We're doing a lot, we're doing well, we're doing a lot better than we were a couple of months ago, but more improvements are needed there. So we learn, it's learning by doing both on our side and from the country's side. Um, a third question I think uh, is how can countries, development partners, other stakeholders build more effective and lasting partnerships with civil society organizations? And on the other side of that equation, how can CSO's capacity to analyze fiscal information and engage as constructive partners with governments and, and development partners to be strengthened. I think both sides of those questions have to be, have to be looked at. Uh, another question I think is, what will be the overall fiscal transparency scores on the open budget survey when in, for 2020? Will these show a decline? Uh, and uh, also, will the quality of governance deteriorate? in countries with weak institutions. We're doing now in the RMF quite a lot of governance assessments, looking at governance system. How will, what will, be, what will be the impact of the crisis on the quality of governance in countries, particularly those with weak institutions? And following that, how should governments, donors, 
civil society organizations respond to these developments? How should we respond to them? And a final question I'd have is how can countries be better prepared for crises like COVID-19 in the future? Should they, for example, build the risks of pandemics into their fiscal risk statements? They don't do this at the moment, but they could do it in the future. How should they ensure business continuity in situations like this? Some countries already do have business continuity plans built into their government systems. Others do not. So how can that be managed better? So there's a few questions from, from my side. Lots of thanks to do so that this does not happen again the same way. <laughs> <laughs> At least. Mihaela, please. Well, thank you. I have also a few questions. Uh, one of the first questions is how to motivate executives to publish consolidated, understandable, timely, and open fiscal data in normal times as well as in, in times of crisis. And what kind of fiscal data and how should be published? Because as we all know, uh, public funds are uh, limited and we usually have to prioritize. So we, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I think that um, I am still not sure what kind of fiscal data and how should they be published so that people use them. So that citizens, researchers, and for example, parliamentarians use them. And another similar question for me that is open is uh, how to motivate citizens to use published fiscal data and how to motivate members of parliament to more actively participate in budget processes and pressure government to provide them with more timely and more understandable fiscal data. In Croatia, we usually have time, uh, we usually, what happens is that uh, parliamentarians, they get the data, but they get the data at the last minute and they are not understandable to them usually. So sometimes they ask us to explain what is written in those data. So another thing is what is open for me and I'm thinking about is how to motivate even made media to invest more in understanding fiscal budgetary and budgetary issues. For example, uh, I was once on one meeting with several uh, very important media houses in Croatia, and I asked them, how can we help you with uh, analysis of fiscal budgetary issues? And they t told me like, uh, okay, it's easy. Uh, we need everything like, uh, if, if you uh, publish everything that we can get in three clicks, it will be okay. But I don't think that they understand that for, they usually, they will need <laughs> analysis, you know. So, I don't know how much media is in, is understanding fiscal and budgetary issues and how good they are, are the, they are mediators uh, for, uh, between Ministry of Finance and citizens. Okay, thanks. Um, well, it's it's hard. I think um, open contracting has a lot of experience in motivating and incentivizing the use of data, especially from journalists and it's not easy data of open contracting. I don't know if you would like to say something about that. About working with the users of the data and get the, getting them to Particular, easy. yeah. The journalists are saying it's so yes, we have been working a lot with journalists uh, since the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis and even before. Um, one of the things uh, that, that we've done is we've put together actually a special newsletter for journalists that pull together um, relevant stories uh, from around the world about um, procurement and COVID and the challenges that are being experienced. Um, we provide training uh, to journalists. We actually help them to get access to data, uh, to help them to develop their investigations and stories. And uh, the work of journalists can be very impactful in, in oversight. Um, for example, uh, in Paraguay, uh, journalists were reporting quite a bit on the COVID uh, emergency procurement and identified some you know, highly irregular uh, situations which led to the procurement authority changing some policies, uh, for example, requiring uh, procuring entities, including state-owned enterprises, to publish their reference prices for the purchases that they're making uh, with emergency funds that don't have to go through competitive uh, procedures, but they should still be transparent about how they're arriving at the prices they're paying. 
And uh, in addition to that, we have been uh, doing an action research program. Uh, so we're actually supporting journalists from, well, I'm sorry, sorry, academics from 12 countries around the world uh, to do research using uh, COVID-19 procurement information to identify uh, where there are inefficiencies, where things could be improved, uh, where there's accountability gaps, and uh, to then use that, those recommendations to inform policy change and to inform more effective governance of uh, the emergency procurement, but also learning from this uh, going into the future and the recovery. Thank you, Lindsay, because this leaves us on a higher note that not everything are questions. Some of them we're trying to answer already. We're working on it, of course. It's, it's an ongoing process, but... Um, I really want to thank you all for being here. Thank you, Lindsay, Catherine, uh, from Open Contracting Partnership. Everyone is going to have access to these uh, presentations. We're going to have them online. So you can click on the Open Contracting uh, website and the section on COVID. Well, we have Hannah somewhere around there. and. From Richard, I don't know if you want to say some closing message as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with what everyone was saying. I, just three or four points from my side. I think I agree absolutely with the issue about data, all the points made about timely, relevant, understandable data, which is widely used, absolutely critical. Uh, and so absolutely 100% number one point, I think. And I think your guide uh, to the use of fiscal data is very important in that context. Second thing I would emphasize is the need for better audits. I think the audit officers have been lagging behind a little bit in this crisis. I think they need to get themselves engaged more and use more innovative ideas to get quicker, more rapid, more reliable audits done of emergency spending and tax measures. Uh, I think a third area I would say is try and develop the use of digital technology more. A lot of use has been made of it, but I think more use could be made of it. Uh, and I think uh, that's an area which I think is very important. And I think the fourth thing I would say is try and make the changes that have already been made uh, in the context of COVID-19 permanent. In other words, that we shouldn't just slip back after this crisis into our old ways. We should, we should learn from the things we've done well and make sure that, that those things are done in the future, particularly on the provision of data uh, and the better use of audits and some digital technologies and so on. We can actually use this crisis as a way of ratcheting up our performance uh, in transparency and making things better for the long term. I'll stop there. Yeah, we're always speaking Thank about... Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> we're speaking about going back to normal, but some things we don't want to go back to normal, right? Exactly. We don't want to go back to normal, no. And uh, Michaela, I don't know if you have any final words that you would like to say. No, actually, I just wanted to thank you. Thank you all for your sharing your views and experiences and actually motivating me for uh, more uh, work on fiscal transparency in Croatia. Thank you. <laughs> Lindsay, Catherine, any final words? Hi. Okay. Well, so thank you all for participating on this. Please consult the guide, share it with um, your teams and partners and governments and other civil society organizations and journalists so that it, governments start building a better data architecture and then start publishing better. Thank you all and see you tomorrow in the next sessions. Uh, tomorrow the COVID session is English, Spanish, but it's on tax side. So it's on the revenue side. So the ones who are joining, to, joining that one, we're going to have, trans it's going to be on, in Spanish, but with translation to English. So Thank you all. Let, let, let me uh, thank you all, just like Lorena did. Uh, I really have to acknowledge and express my appreciation for Lorena's leadership and work 
on this guide and on these discussions. Uh, thank you, Lorena. This is a fantastic uh, contribution, not only to give to our network, and I would say to a very large community. And fortunately, this session was recorded. It has been so rich in ideas, suggestions, proposals, concerns, thoughts, that I'm surely going to look at it again when we post it. We'll keep you informed. But uh, a very rich document was created just now, thanks to you. See you soon.